Please be seated. Well, I appreciate the chance to be with you this morning and to join in on this series of Teach Us to Pray. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what your first introductions were to the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I grew up in a tradition where uh, that prayer would have been recited quite often um, on a Sunday morning. And I, I remember in Cubs and Scouts, I wanted to get the religion badge on, the, on kind of the back of my scarf. And so uh, you, you had to memorize some of the creeds, but you also had to, to memorize the Lord's Prayer and then, and then recite that to a minister. But probably the first time I really began to think about the Lord's Prayer uh, was at, at Christian High School where it was um, a, a requirement for all grads to share their testimony kind of in their graduating year. And so uh, me and a friend, as we took our turn, we, we decided we would do the Lord's Prayer and we would decide we'd try to be creative, so we'd do a skit um, th that would kind of call to attention what each of these kind of little phrases were throughout it and, and what it meant for us in, in our lives. And so... Um, Today is kind of this unique opportunity to return to that kind of thinking about what is it that the Lord is teaching us in, in how to pray, um, even through this prayer. Um, last week in the series, you, you started by, by what it means to, to see God as our Heavenly Father. And today, as has already been introduced, we go to kind of the concept of this second phrase, how would be thy name. I was uh, intrigued by some conversation at the other end of the table last week at Thanksgiving as um, my grandsons and my kids were, were chatting and I, I discovered there's a little survey that was going on and it was all about um, what you would call this pie that we were going to be eating for dessert. Is it pumpkin or is it pumpkin? And um, of course it was, it was a little bit of this kind of trying to tease um, grandpa a little bit about his influence on pronunciation and, um, and words in the Uglum family. And, and I get that words are like that. Uh, we, can, we can sort of shape our own unique pronunciations, even as we can kind of absorb our own kind of understandings of words. You know, words like rich, like righteousness can, can come to mean wicked and, and, and wicked can come to mean amazing and believer can come to mean, I said a prayer sometime. Um, not sure what informs what you think and feel when you encounter a word like hello. Though I suspect you run into the word a little more frequently in the month of October as we watch decorations emerge for Halloween. And I, I think it's safe to assume that we have a lot of different understandings of that word. So as uh, we start our conversation today, I, I suppose probably the place to begin is by actually talking a little bit about a definition of hallow. Now, I can't imagine that how would is, is, is a word that rolls off of your tongue a lot at school or, or at Tim's or, or at any such place. Uh, hallow means to, to make holy, to, to sanctify, if you were to take a really brief definition of it. You know, some traditions will hallow the, the bread in the cup before they celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, they, they make these elements holy. Uh, some traditions will hallow a person and, and make them a saint. Most of the traditions I'm involved in are, are more adept at how we establish someone as a jerk than we are as someone as a, a saint. But, you know, we, we have these little traditions and, and methods. Before we get lost, though, in that rabbit trail, let's, let's return to this context of the prayer. To, to hallow is to, to establish something as holy, as, as unique, as sacred, as distinct. distinct. In some ways, I, I kind of think it's part of the intention of a marriage ceremony. It's to gather a, a, a particular, it's to make a particular relationship between a, 
a man and a woman, legitimate, uh, set apart, binding, sanctified, unique, perhaps even holy. So I suppose in some ways it, it, it is something we hallow. And so in this important phrase in the Lord's Prayer, how would be your name? It's a declaration that God's name should be holy, uh, established as holy, sanctified, hallowed in, in every way. In, in our thinking, you know, the very uttering of God's name, in, in our feeling, in, in how we hear and, and react to God's name. In, in, in reverence, in, in what it represents. How, like the believer and believing should mark every part of us. But of course, for, for most of us, perhaps all of us, we're, we're still left with this task of checking in with what it even means to be holy. And, and, and what has shaped your particular ideas about that word. Our culture has um, so much influence on what we think and how we respond. As, as dangerous as you know, Hollywood or Disney or social media are as a source of truth, they do do a remarkable job of reflecting what our society believes. Now, this movie that I've chosen is, is likely so old that you need help with even what the storyline of it is. So old that Disney's actually had a chance at giving us several versions of it. But let's, let's, let's take Aladdin as a bit of a case study in what it says about divinity and power. You know, it's, it's set in, in an Eastern culture it, where rulers are divine and, and where powers are, are something everybody wants to wield. Well, maybe that's Western too, not just Eastern. Um, but, you know, just to kind of refresh you in kind of the basic storyline, you know, it's a, it's a story of a street rat, a, a kid who's, who's stealing and having fun and doing his own thing, who eventually gets connected with the princess of the story, gets transformed from bad to good and resurrected by the end as a king. You know, kind of the same elements of all the tales and, and certainly of many of the Disney stories. And so early in the plot, you have this, this cave of wonders where they're, they're seeking this magic lantern. And, and when you enter the cave, the, the great power declares, who, who disturbs my slumber? Sort of like all of our pearly gate stories where, where people are set up to pass an attendance test. Are, are, are you worthy to, to enter? Are you worthy to get in? And so this great power declares, you know, in that kind of booming voice, know this, only one may enter here. One whose worth lies far within the diamond in the rough. Proceed but touch nothing but the lamp. Meaning, don't let your desire kill you. It, it, it's the plot of many of our stories. You know, who can pull the sword from the stone? Who can carry the ring? Who can defeat the powers of the dark lords? The one with special innocence, purity, that, that diamond in the rough. And so we are put on this quest to be holy, to figure out the code, to be transformed in some way, to become righteous, I suppose. You know, even in the church, we have these understandings, these ways to act, uh, ways to think uh, about how you become what you must be. And to be sure, it's a lot of pressure on us. The question in all of this, though, is, is, is our thinking, kind of our understanding, is it, is it kind of three parts Hollywood, two parts gospel, one part family of origin? You know, what actually is the mix of our truth on this? So when you, when you turn to God, 
to the one in whom we sing, holy, 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 as we just have, merciful and mighty, when you read of the one who's on the throne, high and exalted, where, where people are covering their faces and declaring they are ruined and have unclean lips, as they do in Isaiah, how do we make sense of this? In what way are we to hallow God's name? In what manner are we to exalt him? Our Father, who is in heaven, how would be your name. Preparing and uh, reading for this conversation has, has flipped my answer to the question and, and profoundly changed my thinking, and I, I'm grateful for it. Um, I, I, I need to thank uh, an Alliance theologian, Bernie Vanderwall, and, and his book, Rethinking Holiness. I, I, I highly recommend it. It was so beneficial to me in thinking this through for today. When I think of holiness, to be honest, I, I do think of the tiger-mouthed cave in the Aladdin desert, warning all who would continue to pray. Know that only diamonds, the holy, the worthy, the capable of not being distracted by gold, should step further into this prayer. And to be sure, we, we respect and long to be and find those kinds of diamonds. Oh, for friends, siblings, parents, kids, whichever perspective you want to take, leaders who were a bit more holy. Oh, for communities, yea, even for churches that were a bit more holy, worthy, filled with life that gave and didn't take. In lots of ways, those even outside of the church like and long for holiness. Or perhaps more honestly, we really notice it when it's absent in others. So in, in, in what regard is God holy? And, and what does this matter to us? Why, why would we hallow his name? Lots that we could... Uh, tease out and, and consider on this subject. And to be sure, it's, it's worth giving it more like the eight hours it would take you to read Bernie's book. But, but let's see what we can do kind of in the next 15 or so, or so minutes. Our Father in heaven, how would be your name? Holy is your name. Bernie sets out kind of two aspects to what it means to be holy in the scriptures. I came to this conversation with mostly one of the two in mind. And, and here is what I was missing or forgetting. To be holy in the scriptures is to be wholly distinct. Perhaps the, the word transcendent as much as it's an unfamiliar word, would be a helpful word here. Really to be beyond comparison. Holiness is, is about more than morality, which is where I was going to start on this. God is holy because God is not like anything that exists. He's not the more righteous God in a lineup of righteous gods. He's not the more powerful being in a lineup of powerful beings. He's not the tiger of all tigers. He stands entirely alone with no competitor. Nothing even remotely close. God is beyond and different from all the categories. A completely separate being. He is holy, holy Distinct, the one and the only. Unlike the worlds of the Greeks and the Romans and, and all of the influences around 
the writers of our scriptures. Un unlike other religions like Hindu, he's, he's not the best of the gods or one of many gods and you just choose the one you like. He is, well, let's, let's look at some of the passages of scripture that have actually tried to tease this out for us. Take Exodus 15.11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You know, this was the point of the, all the Egyptian pl plagues that, that Moses was introducing to Pharaoh. It was to show that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was a completely superior to any of these gods the people had thought of or created. And were worshipping there in Egypt. Or, or take Psalm 86 verse 8. There's none like you among the gods, O Lord. None are there, nor are there any works like yours. Our worship often acknowledges this. Take, take this one from Samuel. There is none holy like the Lord. For there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God, which we so often sing. Or we can just keep going here. First Kings, O Lord, God of Israel, there's none, no God like you. In heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Jeremiah says the same. There's, there's none like you, O Lord. You are great and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. We could keep going, but let me pause with this one from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the king of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. God speaking, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me. There is no God. Bernie um, awakened me again to the fact that there are several ways to think of holy. For me, the default has often been to say righteous. But his reminder was that the primary meaning of holiness in the scriptures is to name God's transcendence. His profound uniqueness in every dimension. He is wholly other than anything else we know. There's nothing to which we can compare him. Not just in terms of morality, but in every regard and on every dimension. He's more than the standard. He is the, he is the essence. We are invited to be holy through connection with this God. An active, live, and vibrant connection with him. This is what we're doing when we hallow God's name. Uh, Tom Wright is kind of helpful in, in me kind of shaping some of my thoughts and thinking on this. Tom Wright summarizes this by saying... Um, I'll read a little bit of the intro to the quote and then what you have on the screen here. Our God is not a man-made idol. He, he's the living God who dwells in heaven and longs to see his sovereign and saving rule come to birth on earth. And then he goes on to, to say of the Lord's Prayer, this is in fact a prayer for the kingdom of God to be fully present. Not for God's people to be snatched away from earth to heaven, but for the glory and beauty of heaven to be turned into earthly reality here as well. When that is done, God's name, his character, his reputation, his very presence will be held in high honor everywhere. How would? The first half of this prayer is thus all about God and then what's on the screen. Prayer that doesn't start there is always in danger of concentrating on ourselves. And very soon it stops being prayer altogether and collapses into the random thoughts, fears, and longings of our own mind. 
I so resonated with that because that's exactly my tension whenever I pray. I, I, I come to pray and then the next thing my mind is going, and it's just like, ah, oh, is this not my opportunity to connect with this transcendent God? It's so important in prayer that we actually look at God our Father. That we become present with God and with his holiness. That we actually connect with God. That we, we recognize, remember, become conscious of whom it is that we are turning to. Father, may you indeed be holy in every way. May I see you for who you are, the only God. Of course, we, we don't make God. But rather, this is a prayer to recognize that God is holy, transcendent, completely other. And that, amazingly, he desires to connect with you. He loves us dearly and wants to reach out to us. D.A. Carson, another author that I was looking at, summarizes it this way. God's name is a reflection of who he is. God's name is God himself as he is and has revealed himself. And so his name is already holy. Holiness often thought up as separateness is less an attribute than what he is. It has to do with the very Godhood of God. Therefore, To pray that God's name be hallowed is not to pray that God may become holy, but that he may be treated as holy. That his name should not be despised by the thoughts and conduct of those who have been created in his image. So what does this mean for for us? As the people wanting to learn to pray. How is it that we need to enter prayer? What what invitation or opportunity must we consider? Like that of the card warning the person who might disturb God's slumber. As broken as that whole picture and image is. All the way through the story of scripture. We have these pictures of things becoming holy when they are given to God, when they are brought into the temple, when they are offered and presented to God, when they are sprinkled, and and when they are connected with God in some way, they become holy. When we hallow God's name, of course, we now are recognizing that God is holy. And the more that realization lingers, starts to to mark our thoughts, our feelings, and perhaps even our body, the more closely we become connected with God. The more fully we take our place as those created in his image, reflecting his holiness. And that is why the writers of scripture again and again talk about becoming the people of God. Being reunited with God in Christ. Acknowledging how Christ is in us. And how we put on Christ, his love, humility. We we start to value relationship and being filled with the spirit of Christ. This is all packed into this, how would be your name? Paul In the book of Romans, in chapter 12, 1 and 2, offers this great confession of the people of God. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, perfect will of God. When we hallow God's name, we transform our thoughts. We say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, show me your thoughts. 
Show me your holiness. Show me how you see this day, this trial, this week, this challenge, this joy, this sorrow. Give me your eyes. Let this permeate my mind and my heart and my tongue and my hands and my reactions and all of me. Let me set aside my perspective and take on yours as revealed in Christ in the word of God. May my thoughts and even my posture, my thinking, hallow your name. Sweep me into a new way of living. This is where Paul goes in the remainder of Romans chapter 12 and 13. As he begins to describe the humbling of ourselves, the learning to love others, even our enemies, the, the rejoicing in hope, the not paying back evil for evil, the, the not taking vengeance, the not conquered by evil, but the conquering of evil with good is all wrapped up in our turning to God, our connection with Him, our making His name Howard. We're created in the image of God. May we now hallow that image and hallow His name by acknowledging that, that our relationship to him is, is, is central to everything. May we put on the Lord Jesus Christ in such a way that our thoughts are transformed. And it is Jesus who lives in and through this body of ours. Too often I, I get this all wrong. <laughs> I think that I'm making God holy because that's what I'm trying to do to me. I think holiness is about my actions in my strength, something I can achieve or create. And to be sure, how I live, how we live matters a lot. But this holiness comes from our connection to Jesus. And how that strengthened connection transforms me. Christ in me. Me in Christ. If I'm understanding your Teach Us to Pray series, there's this invitation each week to kind of step into prayer in perhaps a new way or in a, in a bit of a new practice. And uh, I'd like to suggest for this week that that practice might indeed be silent prayer. As much as that's kind of weird even to say, how do you pray silently? Um, it, it, it's an invitation to set aside words and sit and acknowledge that God is here. That God has already spoken and that, that God is wholly transcendent and completely other. And in all of this, his compassion spills over into wanting to connect with us. I um I I've known God's existence my entire life. I've passionately believed in God my entire life. But I have come to see in these last years that my connection with God has been really weak. My sense of relationship with him is just like ah oh, it's got to be more. And I find that when I come to pray, I get going in my words and my words and my words. And I don't know that I ever even become conscious that I'm actually praying to God. So I've been trying lately to just take a few minutes of this silence. And just get ready to even sit with God. To recognize that, that he's right here kind of intentionally try to stop all the noise that runs in my head all the time and just say okay lord not my words right now let me just sit with you let me sit with what you want to do let me be present to you 
Present to isn't a skill I'm very good at really in any context. Present to my wife, present to my kids, present to the situation. And so this is a learning edge for me in all sorts of ways. To be present to God in this moment. To hallow his name. To become alert. To confess what the scriptures have already revealed to me. To sit and truly sit in my belief. In God. And so I want to invite you to take the next two or three minutes. All of us to just maybe just practice this. And then the worship team will come and, and close our service. But, but this, is, this is the invitation. It's... It's an invitation to turn to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To, again, just to quiet our hearts, to settle the noise, to hallow His name. To recognize His presence. And if you so desire, to allow your hearts to begin to respond to all that He has done.